Hello, everyone. This is the first recorded module on carbohydrate chemistry, and this material will be on the final. It is also important because you will see it on the MCAT. That's actually why I decided to make this video. It will be available to you whenever you are getting ready for the MCAT, D or T, or related exam. Our recorded lectures, unfortunately, are not, but this will be available. The first thing I wanna talk about is stereochemistry. If you look at this figure, which comes from the textbook, I made the point in lecture that all of the carbohydrates that are most common are related to the stereochemistry of D-glyceraldehyde. And what we're looking at here are Fischer projections. And Fischer projections are particularly handy for carbohydrate chemistry because they have this really easy way of indicating stereochemistry. As I pointed out, all of the carbohydrates we normally find are in the D configuration because the carbon farthest from the carbonyl, that's chiral, has the same configuration as D-glyceraldehyde. And you know that because the OH group is on the right. To switch stereochemistry, you switch the location left to right of the functional groups, the OH and the hydrogen. So when you compare erythros to threos, you can see that the difference is the stereochemistry at this other position. They're both D-carbohydrates, but they have a different stereochemistry at the next position. When you look at the other common carbohydrates, you'll notice the same trend. They're all D-carbohydrates because of the stereochemistry at the carbon farthest from the carbonyls. In this case, these are all aldehydes. However, they differ in the stereochemistry of the other chiral centers. And you can tell because the OH group and the hydrogen is moving from left to right or right to left in the different combinations. The same is true of the longer sugars, such as glucose. Again, they're all D-carbohydrates, you can see that, but they differ by the location and the chirality at each different position. And what we see is essentially all combinations. The two molecules we're gonna spend most of our time talking about, because frankly, they're two of the more common that you're gonna find in, in nature, is ribose and glucose. D-ribose and D-glucose. Before we get there though, I wanna talk about something that you've seen before. And that is those Fischer projections were indicating molecules that were in the linear form, but we know that's not true. And I wanna emphasize, and I want you to just remember this, for glucose, alpha is axial and then beta is equatorial. But it's worth absolutely burning that into your mind. Alpha is axial. But let's go back to some chemistry that we learned last semester. And that was acetal formation from an aldehyde or ketone. And this is the actual mechanism sheet that we filled in. There's no reason for us to go through this in detail. Other than I wanna remind you that in this process, if we start with in this case, an aldehyde, we've got our alcohol with a source of protons, namely sulfuric acid. We first protonate the carbonyl to make this a much better red hot electrophile. Then the alcohol can attack. And when we take a proton away, we end up with our hemiacetal intermediate. In a linear form, this is not stable. But of course, we know that when it's cyclic, it is stable, and that's what's related to carbohydrates. So when we look at that, we talked about this before. We talked about how in a cyclic form, the cyclic hemiacetal, the ones shown here, are actually stable. But when we make the new bond, the one indicated here, we can get two different stereoisomers. In the case of a non-chiral starting aldehyde with an alcohol attached, 
at either carbon five or four, you get a six membered or a five membered ring and you get a racemic mixture because that OH group can either be coming towards you or going away, you get two different chiral centers. When we convert that to thinking about a carbohydrate, we see that it's related. So in the case of D-glucose, which has six carbons, it's the OH group on carbon five that is gonna make a six-membered ring. And that six-membered ring can come in two forms. If it comes in the form that's shown with the OH group pointing toward us, and in the context of all the other chiral centers, that means all of the different OH groups are gonna be equatorial. That is gonna be the more stable, but as you know, that's going to be beta because the OH group at the carbon that we call the anomeric carbon, that's what was the aldehyde, carbon number one, the anomeric carbon has the OH group equatorial, that means it's beta. The other stereoisomer has the OH group here is axial. And remember, alpha is axial. It might be the less stable of the two by a little bit, but it is the alpha form. And you now know what the D is for, the D-glucose. All right, that's where we were previously in the semester. Let's move on a little bit with some new words. It turns out that there are two structures that in organic chemistry have the common name either furan or pyran. Furan is a five-membered ring with an ether oxygen. You'll recognize that furan, furan is aromatic. That's not important for what we're talking about now, but it is aromatic. Pyran, on the other hand, is a six-membered ring it's not aromatic because it's got an sp3 carbon. Again, that's not important for us. It is a relatively common structure in organic chemistry, and it's a common name that's applied. Well, for that reason, it turns out that when we talk about carbohydrates, they can either be usually five-membered rings or six-membered rings. We use these terms to talk about them to say that a five-membered ring carbohydrate is called a furanose, and a six-membered ring carbohydrate is called a pyranose. And this is the part that you're responsible for that you might see on the final, because furanose and pyranose names are very common in biochemistry, and you might even find them on the MCAT. In addition, we can go a step further. It turns out the molecule on the left is ribose. So we can call this beta D-ribose. We can call the molecule on the right beta D-glucose, but now we can combine the two names and say that on the left here, we have beta D-ribofuranose. And that's a name you might find in biochemistry. And it's simply referring to the five-membered ring. You now know how all of this works together because beta is referring to this not being in an axial position. The D refers to the stereochemistry of the ribose. If we go back, it's because that molecule derived from D ribose right here. And it's a furanose because it's a five membered ring. Similarly, we can look at the molecule on the right and what we had called just beta D-glucose can more appropriately be described as beta because as I've drawn it, I've drawn it equatorial at the anomeric carbon. There's the anomeric carbon. That's why it's beta. It's D-glucose. You now know why. It's referred to as the D stereoisomer of glucose but it's a pyranose because it's a six-membered ring. So that is a term you might see on the MCAT, beta d glucopyranose. Now, I've kind of moved quickly around the fact that here we've got a structure that you're fairly familiar with in how to draw a chair cyclohexane or appropriately here, a chair carbohydrate. 
But this is a kind of structure you haven't seen before for the ribose, except you've probably seen that in the context of pictures of DNA. It's a very common kind of structure. It's got a name, a specific name, and that name is a Hayworth projection. And in a Hayworth projection, you flatten out the ring and you use shading to indicate which carbon atoms are towards you. And it's kind of a nice projection because what it does, it allows you to say what is up and what is down. You lose the ability to immediately understand what's equatorial versus axial, but it's very clear what is up and what is down so that it's a little bit easier for some people to see the stereochemistry. For cyclohexanes, or in particular pyranoses, I prefer the chair conformation because then you get the uh, perspective on what's axial and what's equatorial. But if all you're doing is comparing stereoisomers, it's real easy to figure out what's up and down with the Hayworth projection. And I thought it was something that I would just show you. Okay, last thing I want to talk about. Not all the carbohydrates simply have hydroxyl groups around them. There is a very common derivative found in a lot of complex carbohydrates in living systems that have nitrogen atoms in the place of the OH. And often, in fact, most often, they are in the form of an amide. In the case of N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, there is an acetyl group attached. This is a very common molecule, and it's important in a lot of biochemical contexts. And it's referred to as glicnac because it is so common. It's found as one of the, the very common sugars that decorates different cells as well as connected to different proteins. Okay, well, this ends the first module.